Dear students, welcome to the unit number 5 of the software engineering. In the previous unit, we studied basic of software requirement analysis and its principles and concepts. In this unit, we will study different models which are created in the phase of requirement analysis. After completing this unit, you should be able to understand what is modeling and why do we need models. Identify the characteristics of good modeling tools. Explain the components of analysis modeling. Understand what is data, functional and behavioral modeling. Outline the ways how we draw entity relationship diagrams, data flow diagrams and state transition diagrams. Understand how to create data dictionary. Analysis modeling is about creating data, functional and behavioral models of the system. The respective graphic tools we use for analysis modeling purposes are Entity Relationship Diagram Data Flow Diagram State Transition Diagram The Entity Relationship Diagrams emphasize the data objects and their relationships. The Data Flow Diagram illustrates the functions that the system must perform and the State Transition Diagram focuses on the time-dependent behavior of the system. The supporting textual modeling tools provide precise definitions of the meaning of the components and connections. For example, process specifications describe textually the functions outlined in data flow diagrams. Control specification describes control features in textual form. So does data description describe the ER diagram. The figure on your screen shows the components of the analysis modeling. The system analyst uses models to Number 1. Focus on important system features while downplaying less important features. Number 2. Discuss changes and corrections to the user's requirements with low cost and minimal risk. Number 3. Verify that the system analyst correctly understands the user's requirements and has documented it in such a way that the system designers and programmers can build the system. Let us see briefly the characteristics of good modeling tools. It should be graphical with appropriate supporting textual detail. It should allow the system to be viewed in a top-down, partitioned fashion. It should have minimal redundancy. It should help the reader predict the system's behavior. It should be transparent to the reader. Dear students, let us now turn our attention towards the second element of analysis modeling, that is, data flow diagram. The data flow diagram is a modeling tool that allows us to picture a system as a network of functional processes connected to one another by flows and data stores. The data flow diagram is one of the most commonly used systems modeling tools, particularly for operational systems in which the functions of the system are of more importance and complex than the data that the system manipulates. Let us see the components of a DFT. Figure on your screen shows a typical DFT for a small system. Before we examine its components in detail, notice several things. It hardly needs to be explained at all one can simply look at the diagram and understand it. The notation is simple and unobtrusive and in a sense intuitively obvious. The diagram fits easily onto one page. 
this means two things. Number one, someone can look at the diagram without being overwhelmed and number two, the system that is being modeled by the diagram is not very complex. The diagram has been drawn by a computer. There is nothing wrong with a hand-drawn diagram. As we can see from the figure that DFD has four components. Process, Flows, Data Store, External Entities. The first component of the DFD is known as a process. The process can also be referred to as a bubble, a function or a transformation. The process shows a part of the system that transforms inputs into outputs, that is, it shows how one or more inputs are changed into outputs. The process is represented graphically as a circle as shown in figure on your screen. The process is given descriptive name which describes what the process does. Process name generally consists of a verb object phrase such as validate input or compute tax rate. The flow a flow is represented graphically by an arrow into or out of a process. Examples of flow are shown in the figure. The flow is used to describe the movement of chunks or packets of information from one part of the system to another part. Thus, the flows represent data in motion. The flows in figures on your screen are named. The name represents the meaning of the packet that moves along the flow. Note also that the flows show direction. An arrowhead at either end of the flow indicates whether data or material are moving into or out of a process. The store the store is used to model a collection of data packets at rest. The notations for a store are shown in figure. Typically, the name chosen to identify the store is the plural of the name of the packets that are carried by flows into and out of the store. Figure shows a fragment of a system in which, as a matter of user policy, the order entry process may operate at different times or possibly at the same time as the order inquiry process. The orders store must exist in some form, whether on disk, tape or card. If we were to exclude the issues and model only the essential requirements of the system, there would be no need for the orders store. We would instead have a DFD like this one. External Entity The next component of the DFD is External Entity. It is graphically represented as a rectangle. External entity represents the entities with which the system communicates. User is an example of external entity. Guidelines for the construction of DFT. We have seen that data flow diagrams are composed of four simple components. Processes, flows, stores and external entities. We need more than the knowledge of the components of DFT in order to draw DFT successfully. The guidelines we study now will enable you to draw correct 
and readable DFD. The guidelines are Choose meaningful names for processes, flows, stores and terminators. Number the processes. Redraw the DFD as many times as necessary. Avoid overly complex DFDs. Make sure the DFD is internally consistent and consistent with any associated DFD. Let us see brief detail of these guidelines. Choose meaningful names. We have already explained the importance and conventions of naming different components of the DFT appropriately. However, we would like to add that domain-specific abbreviation and acronyms should be avoided. And if the DFT is being drawn by someone with a programming background, the programming-oriented terminology such as routine, procedure, subsystem, and function should also be avoided. Number the processes. As a convenient way of referencing the processes in a DFD, most system analysts number each bubble. It does not matter how you go about doing this, left to right, top to bottom, or any other convenient pattern will do as long as you are consistent in how you apply the numbers. It is important to note that no explicit indication of the sequence of processing or conditional logic is supplied by the diagram. Procedure or sequence may be implicit in the diagram. Thus, one should not confuse a DFD with a flowchart. Avoid overly complex DFTs. The purpose of a DFD is to accurately model the functions that a system has to carry out and the interactions between those functions. But another purpose of the DFD is to be read and understood not only by the system analyst who constructed the model but by the users who are the expert in the subject matter. This means that the DFD should be readily understood, easily absorbed and pleasing to the eye. Redraw the DFD as many times as necessary. In a real world system analysis project, the DFD may be redrawn many times before it is technically correct and acceptable to the user. Make sure that your DFT is logically consistent. There are some guidelines that we use now to ensure that the DFT itself is consistent. The major consistency guidelines are these. Number 1. Avoid infinite sinks, bubbles that have inputs but no outputs. These are also known by system analysts as black holes. Number two, avoid output only bubbles. Bubbles that have output but no input are suspicious and generally incorrect. One plausible example of an output only bubble is a random number generator but it is hard to imagine any other reasonable example. A typical output only bubble is shown in the figure. Number three, there should not be any unlabeled flows or unlabeled processes. Behavioral models. Dear students, most software responds to events from the outside world as shown in the figure. An event may also be generated by the system process itself. 
An occurrence of an event causes the system to exhibit some predictable form of behavior. A behavioral model creates a representation of the states of the software and the events that cause the software to change its state. A state transition diagram, STD, can be used to represent the behavior of the system. For behavioral modeling, we use following steps. Make a list of the different states of a system. How does the system behave? Indicate how the system makes a transition from one state to another. How does the system change state? Indicate event. Indicate action. And lastly, draw a state transition diagram, STD. The notation used to make a transition diagram is shown in figure. To understand the use of state transition diagram, consider software embedded within an office photocopying machine. The photocopier performs a number of functions for example, it reads user's input, makes copies, reloads paper, performs problem diagnosis, etc. There are four states in which photocopier machine software can be. Number one, reading command. Number two, making copies. Number three, reloading paper. Number four, Diagnosing problem. Apart from user's input, there can be other events which can change the state of the software. For example, copies done, paper reload complete, paper jammed, etc. A simplified state transition diagram for the photocopier software described above is shown in figure. When photocopier machine is started, it is ready for reading user's input. If user inputs the command to copy, system goes into copying state if papers are available. If during copying, papers finish, system goes to reload paper state. When reload is complete, system goes back to initial state of reading command. If user gives the command to continue the copying job, system will re-enter the copying state and will keep on copying till the job is finished and it notifies the system that job is done and goes back to initial state of reading command. While copying, paper can be jammed in the machine. In that case, system will enter the diagnosing problem state. When the jammed paper is removed, system will go back to reading command state. If user wants to continue with copying job, system will go back to copying till the job is 